Well guys, I'd say we've made it pretty deep into new Silent Hill territory at this point, and even though we've come across two games that are actually pretty damn good in their own right, we've yet to bring back that original SH feeling. It seems like the Western developers charged with the franchise either don't fully understand the purpose of the original games, or they're far too interested in revolutionizing the tried and true formula that made the early games in the series so great. And I guess it's not the worst idea in the world, but it just hasn't been done well enough to lead to a truly great Silent Hill experience. And with that, we have to dive into yet another crack at reinventing the wheel, a new attempt at dragging that isolated ghost town into the new age. Guys, once more, we're going to need to dig into the events surrounding Silent Hill, only this time we won't be spending too much time in the titular town itself. No, we have a new waypoint circled on the map, and I'd appreciate it if you guys joined me in figuring out how this all leads back to that vacation spot just off of Toluca Lake. Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to Silent Hill. Silent Hill Homecoming came about at a very odd spot in the SH timeline. At the time, we fans knew that Team Silent would no longer be working on the series, but I think there was still an air of hope surrounding the franchise. Sure, we had seen some potholes in the road previously, but honestly, that's to be expected. Every series is going to have entries that don't work as well as the others, and even though Western developers now had control of the Silent Hill series, there was still a chance we could get something worthwhile out of their efforts. After all, Silent Hill is a beloved name in video games. Those people working on the next one would no doubt be fans of the originals, and as such, we could probably expect them to keep the core of those earlier titles alive, right? Mayor Bartlett, I need to talk to you. Yeah? Well, make an appointment in my office. Yeah, well, I assume most of you know how that went. The team working on Homecoming was Double Helix, an amalgamation of other dev teams caught up in mergers and acquisitions. And while the sum of their parts had made some pretty awesome properties, together Double Helix was responsible for maybe one good title throughout their time in the industry. So we knew not to expect too much from these guys as far as a AAA release went, but luckily writing a game's story doesn't require a multi-million dollar budget and a team full of talented creators. All we could hope for at this point was for at least a portion of the staff to be intimately familiar with the source material and have a real drive to write a genuine Silent Hill story. So let's talk about how that didn't happen. What's that guy doing? At this point in the retrospective, you guys are hopefully well aware that I hold the original three games in the Silent Hill series in very high esteem. I think they were a perfect combination of psychological horror and religious elements. They spoke to a very understanding of American horror tropes and seemed to have been filtered through a lens made up of equal parts Twin Peaks and some low-budget cult documentary. So it probably won't come as a shock that I don't think Homecoming did a good job of emulating that style. That being said, there were a few elements that I thought made for a very interesting story. The game brings a very unique premise to the table, but at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it just wasn't Silent Hill. But before we get too deep into that, let's talk about what exactly is going on here. The game starts pretty radically, with our main character Alex Shepard being rolled on a gurney through some kind of hospital. We learn that he's either current or ex-military as he's asking about the condition of his unit. Mirroring scenes found in Jacob's Ladder the game does a lot to show that this hospital isn't exactly in the business of helping people. Not long after being taken to what looks like an examination room, we witness one of the game's monsters attack the staff, and our unarmed protagonist takes this as a very clear sign that he needs to jet. After working our way through the disheveled hospital, our guy finds a kid who he apparently knows, and upon chasing him is thrust into the other world. Then after getting killed by a certain geometrical nightmare, yes, I will be bitching about this later, our protagonist Alex wakes up in the cab of a truck, where we find out that Silent Hill Homecoming takes a step away from the series right off the bat by taking place mostly outside the titular town, which isn't exactly a revolutionary idea in the series, but at least worth pointing out. 75% of the game takes place in Shepherd's Glen, a small town that could definitely take third place in a Silent Hill lookalike contest, though. That aside, Alex's arrival teaches us a few key things. First, he's a combat vet who's been gone a pretty long time. Second, the town is much more empty and quiet than it used to be, and third, Alex doesn't exactly like being here. 
After returning home, we find Alex's mom is more or less catatonic, and it seems like she's not going to be helping him with his goal of finding his brother and getting the hell out of Dodge. From here, we're introduced to a pretty extensive cast of characters in Silent Hill standards, and it becomes clear that whatever's happening here in Shepherd's Glen, certain members of the town are either involved or actively covering it up, which seems like a pretty futile effort when most of the town's population is missing and there are bloodthirsty abominations roaming the streets. Either way, Alex is committed to finding his little brother, but it seems like finding out just what's happening keeps getting pushed higher and higher up the priority list. As the game goes on, we're treated to flashbacks that paint Alex's home life as not quite ideal, but they also hint at him being a lot closer to the odd events of present than he first thought. And as far as general setups go, well, that's about it. The baseline standard of OG Silent Hill stories withstanding, it's not the worst attempt to date, but before we get into my issues with this tale, we're going to need to dive a little bit deeper than some of you might be willing to go. If you haven't played Homecoming yet or you don't want all the reveals spoiled for you, click the link in the description or skip to the timestamp on screen. Alright, on to the spoilers. Okay, so to make sure we're all on the same page still, Alex is back in his old hometown specifically to get his little brother and get the hell out. But his brother appears to be missing along with his dad, and his mom has proven to be less than helpful. As our trek continues, we find out that our relatives aren't the only ones going missing, and this mystery is actually pretty good at keeping me engaged at this point. There were these tiny bits of breadcrumbs here and there, hinting at certain prominent figures in the town being involved in some very odd shit, but you gotta wait damn near till the end for any of this stuff to get resolved, and that's a little too long to spring a player on with almost nothing in between. For those of you that were patient enough to wait till the end, we learned that Alex was never a war vet. In fact, he never even enlisted. All the time he spent away from Shepherd's Glen was actually in a mental institution. See, the reason Alex can't find his brother is because his brother's dead. Now, I know everybody probably saw that coming, but what you might not have seen coming is the fact that Alex is the one that caused that death. That is, if you had never played Silent Hill 2 before. Yet, we got the old James Sunderland tango to deal with here, only Homecoming wasn't happy with just one big endgame reveal. Not long after the whole brother being dead thing, we find out that Shepherd's Glen was actually established by members of Silent Hill's demon-worshipping cult looking to leave the religion. As the story goes, these cult members cut a deal with their comrades, requiring them to sacrifice their children at specific intervals, and it seems like Alex was the next in line. But when he accidentally caused the death of his little brother, their dad tried to use his already dead son as a stand-in. Now, to be honest, this is a very very cool premise, and in any other media this would have been a home run for me. After all, I love cult stuff, and I get a huge kick out of media that takes horrifying fantasy ideas and plops them down in believable modern settings. However, there are two big issues with this approach, at least in my opinion. First off, the whole Alex causing Josh's death and forgetting about it thing would have been a lot more interesting if it weren't a shot-for-shot -shot copy of Silent Hill 2's plot. Now, I know SH2 didn't invent the concept, but at this point in the series, every single Silent Hill entry past 4 had been a tale of a main character experiencing a traumatic event, coming to Silent Hill, and then dealing with their baggage. Maybe in another property, this could have been a novel approach, but here in the SH universe, it was just another entry in a long list of attempts at snagging some of James Sunderland's nerd cred. Now, all that withstanding, I'm more than willing to look past this obvious attempt at copying the one and only Silent Hill game anyone seems to think exists, as long as there's a killer story attached to it. I think I proved in my Shattered Memories review that I can appreciate a cool story regardless of the aforementioned copy job, but there's one more major issue here, and it's a big one. See, every aspect of Homecoming's story is based on an egregious misunderstanding of Silent Hill's lore. Of course, I'm not such a canon snob that I can't appreciate a good spooky campfire tale, but when you draw so heavily from pre-existing lore, you at the very least have to understand that lore. See, in Homecoming, it's the death of Josh and the breaking of the deal that causes the resident demonic infestation. All of the monsters and the otherworld transitions are caused not by the town of Silent Hill and its spiritual power, but by the god the cult worships, or possibly the cult itself, it's really never made clear. Now a casual fan may not see the issue here, and for obvious reasons, but just in case you haven't seen the other entries in this retrospective, the cult's god has no such power. It essentially exists in fantasy, it's a concept that's able to be drawn into this world after the cult corrupted the spiritual power emanating from Toluca Lake, and even then it required the use of a very powerful psychic. Common tropes in the SH games like Monsters and the Otherworld are all side effects of that power being used for demonic purposes, 
and it never acts on its own. In every game in the series, this power reacts to a character's own inner need for resolution. In one, the other world was a result of Alessa's inner torment leaking into the real world thanks to her split persona. All of the monsters that inhabited the town represented negative aspects of her life as a comatose burn victim. In two, the town reflected James Sunderland's internal desire for punishment derived from the guilt of killing his wife. And in three, Heather being a copy of Alessa, she was still pregnant with the cult's god. A combination of her latent psychic abilities and the very real fetal demon god mixed with the part of her that remembers her god-awful fate led to the hellish otherworld leaking into reality. But in Homecoming, all the negative things going on are the result of a deal between the two groups not being honored. The monsters roaming Shepherd's Glen are a punishment for the townspeople. It's like the cult of Silent Hill is weaponizing the spiritual power of the town, but that's not something they can do. Later in the game, members of the cult actually come to Shepherd's Glen kind of like foot soldiers, which backs up my theory. All these monsters and horrific events, they aren't coming from someone's damaged psyche nor the result of a botched demonic pregnancy on a psychic. It's like the writers thought that Silent Hill's cult were the ones that wielded this power, like their god had any effect on the real world, which it obviously doesn't thanks to the events of Silent Hills 1 and 3. I mean, if it did have such drastic control here in this world, why would they have needed to birth them here? I know I'm being hypercritical here, but not one bit of this story holds up to even the slightest bit of scrutiny from someone who actually understands the events of the previous games, which it's clear these writers didn't. This one seemingly insignificant part of the story shows a very gross misunderstanding of the rest of the games in the series and further proves my theory that most Silent Hill fans have no idea there are any other games in the series that aren't SH2. It's clear these guys went into this not having much of a clue how established concepts worked and as such started with a very flawed premise. Now this may seem like a little nitpick, but it's like they built the foundation for this story on one very incorrect idea and like you would imagine, everything springing from that foundation is increasingly shaky the higher it goes. But I do want to continue this complaining session with everyone present, so let's let the first timers back in. For those of you that skipped ahead, I have some real issues with certain events in this game's story, and without revealing any late game spoilers, let's just say the writers likely never got a good ending in a Silent Hill game before. But that wasn't my chief complaint. There are other smaller things that contribute to my overall distaste for what is an otherwise enjoyable narrative, and like the fanboy I am, all of them are tied to the rest of the series. One thing previous SH games got right was the isolating feeling they were able to get across. There was only ever a small cast of characters which made the world feel more real. After all, it was very easy to suspend your disbelief when there was never anyone present to see any of the messed up stuff that you saw. And since a majority of these characters were typically working against you, you could never trust a thing they said. In Homecoming, the town is full of people in contrast. There's Alex's mom, his dad, Josh, Curtis, Sam, Elle, Elle's mom, Margaret. Then of course there's Carol, Wheeler, Travis from Origins, and even the movie's version of The Order is here. The town is booming in Silent Hill terms, and that sucks for more reasons than just, it's not like the other games. See, these guys were going for a very similar atmosphere to the other entries in the series, but with a cast so big, you're constantly having confirmation that everything you're seeing is indeed real. And that's the truth, I swear. So you've seen the creatures too. That was a big reason the other games were so effective. Your experience was always up for debate, and sometimes an antagonist would call your side of the story into question, making you even more unsure, leading to this ambiguous state where you never truly knew what was real. Homecoming feels more like a big Hollywood horror film with monsters getting a lot of screen time and a small band of down-home Jack and Dianes fighting off the demon horde. On top of this, there are these branching dialogue options that lead to absolutely nothing story-wise. They may give the illusion that there's more than one outcome, but in reality, there are only two times where this is the case. For the rest of the game, anything that isn't the intended option will lead nowhere until you finally exhaust everything but the one choice the writers accounted for. Hey. You're Curtis, right? <laughs> Hello, can I ask you something? I'm busy. Hey man, how's it going? <laughs> this feels so worthless when you're playing and comes across as cheap and shallow and an attempt at winning over modern gamers from its era. At the time, these lame ass attempts at player engagement were all the rage and very rarely were they done right. Without a doubt, I can say Homecoming is 
for sure not in that minority. Last of my complaints is the feeling that the writers couldn't quite pick a tone for the game. We go back and forth between attempts at somber lonely atmosphere to a ragtag group resisting a demonic infestation to head-on hostile levels of torture. It's all over the place and maybe one of those parts of the story worked on you, but I have to imagine even this game's fans wish it would have picked one of these many stories. Maybe it could have just been a story about a town under assault after an event led to a sour deal, or a psychological tale concerning a person blocking out traumatic experiences, or a story where people torture the main character for no explainable reason. It comes across as disjointed, and most of the time when the story was going in a direction I was liking, it would veer off into some other approach, and this process repeated itself throughout the entire experience. And all of this is even more of a disappointment because there really is a spark of something interesting here. It's a really cool premise that gets brought down every time a needless reference to the previous canon is made. It's like it's constantly taking one really interesting step forward, immediately followed by a bland and expected two steps back. I didn't really get into Alex as a character, but he served as a pretty okay avatar for me to experience the story through. He always reacted to a situation like I assume I would given the context, and I started sympathizing with him towards the end. Sadly though, he's surrounded by weaker characters who act irrationally and are never fleshed out enough for us to care much about. Even his main goal of finding his brother becomes dull and old by the middle of the game because we're only ever given one cutscene to humanize him, and it's not exactly what I would call a perfect example of brotherly love. All we have to go on is that Alex claims to love him, but we're never really shown much to cement that in our mind. And I feel like I've railed on long enough here, so I guess all I have to say is the same thing I keep saying in these post-Team Silent videos. This could have been a much more enjoyable story had it not have been attached needlessly to Silent Hill. Sure, it has a million faults, but like I said, it really interested me, and the ending did a number on what I was expecting. That's something I genuinely appreciate. I just wish it would have happened in a game called Shepherd's Glen and not Silent Hill. Oh, and if elected president, I vow to throw everyone who liked having Pyramid Head show up for two cutscenes and having absolutely nothing to do with the story into mandatory re-education camps. Unlike Homecoming Story, its gameplay is rotten right down to its core. It's what I imagine would happen if you ran all the info about Silent Hill's traditionally challenging gameplay into some kind of busted ass AI and hit the modernize button. Instead of roaming a wide open, barely populated small town, we're led down a very strict linear path with little to no deviation. Instead of the punishing combat found in the earlier titles, we have multi-hit combos with spinning knife strikes, dodge rolls, and counter mechanics. Now, I know what you're thinking, damn Jared, that actually sounds pretty cool, and I kind of agree. Sure, it has no place in an SH game, but if done well, it sounds like a pretty cool combination. Sadly, the combat here is janky to a broken degree and reeks of amateur developers shoehorning in popular mechanics seen in other games at the time. Half the time, your dodge will lead to a hit, despite the fact that you were still in the middle of your dodge animation. Kind of like these guys had no idea what iframes were. But when you do end up getting through an enemy's defense and line up some offense of your own, you're more likely to push them out of range with your own combo than actually do any real good. To make matters worse, pushing your foe out of range can be dangerous as hell since one single enemy attack can lead to enough stun for four or five subsequent hits. And I can never tell if this is just a pre dial combo or if the computer is randomly picking the most punishing moves all in a row. So what's there to do? Most monsters will guard against your hits, and even more annoyingly, half of them have the ability to knock you to the ground with guard breaking attacks. Well, you do what we always do when a game puts us in situations like this. Cheese the absolute hell out of the mechanics. See, even the game's most powerful melee weapons take more than 8 hits to kill early game enemies, and in that amount of time, you've probably taken a big chunk of damage, so you have to counterintuitively rely on the game's weakest weapon. The starting knife given to you in the first area of the game is actually the only weapon you'll need to down every single monster you come across, bosses included. It may be weak as all hell, but it packs a buttload of stun and lets you lock enemies down until they eventually die. Now you would assume this wouldn't work on areas with multiple enemies in the same room, but I honestly had maybe two, three occasions where that second foe would hit me. 98% of the time they just sat there waiting for me to finish the 15 to 20 hits it would take to down their buddy. Even when you go up against monsters that block most of your attacks, you just need to hammer on the light attack button until they wind up for a hit of their own, which you will beat with the knife's low amount of startup frames. 
Now, in my opinion, this is roundabout the only way to beat the game without being completely frustrated, as it was incredibly stingy with health items and even more so with its laughably low ammo cap. Not to mention the ridiculous amount of serums you'll accidentally use now that the item menu is a radial wheel. The only issue is, it doesn't feel satisfying. During the entire playthrough, I just felt like I was cheating. I often equipped less effective weapons just to change things up, but I would always switch back right after I would take a stupid amount of damage from a flurry of attacks that I could have sworn I dodged. Now, I know I really came out of the gate swinging here, but unlike other games in the series, Homecoming is mostly combat, and that combat is mostly bad. Thanks to the linear nature of both the exterior and interior areas, exploration is out of the question, and as far as puzzles go, 99% of them can be solved with an item found no more than two rooms away. In most survival horror games, running would be an option, and in some rare cases that can be done here, but most enemies are fast as hell and have long range or lunging attacks that will either set you up for further damage or put you in a position where quick time events are necessary. And would you look at that, we just transitioned into another thing that has no place in Silent Hill games. It seems like every turn in Homecoming has you mashing some kind of combination of buttons, and just like the story elements, this is a very clear example of the developers trying their hardest to include every single gaming trend 2008 had to offer. You're likely looking at footage of the PS3 version of Homecoming right now because some saint created a patch for the PC version that among a near infinite amount of other improvements, got rid of these god-awful butt-mashing inclusions. And don't worry, we will definitely get into that patch later on in the video. Past the god-awful combat and damn near exploitative level of QTEs, we're left with a pretty meh package. Sometimes I would feel that old SH feeling when running around in a great looking section of Shepherd's Glen with all the fog and dilapidated scenery, but then an enemy would show up and I would ready my weapon, leading to a cinematic zoom in to an RE4-esque over the shoulder angle, and I'd start dodge rolling like some Ocarina of Time speedrunner, effectively killing the mood. The typical design of Silent Hill's mostly locked doors, which I really like, becomes incredibly annoying when you attach a very slow animation to them, and the transitions to the other world no longer mean having to navigate a new version of your current area because they're only ever implemented halfway through exploring an area, which makes it feel like you're just moving on to another mostly linear path, this time with some new chain link on it. Plus, they show up so few times that I can't help but feel like they were only included as visual treats for fans of the movie to squee at. Now take all these issues, put them together, and what do you have? Well, a substandard action horror game wearing the skin of a Silent Hill title, but moreover, you have one damn long feeling video game. It may only take 8 or 9 hours your first playthrough, but every time I play this game it always feels like I've been playing it for an eternity. It feels like you go long stretches without any story to lead you on, and there were technical problems that made this stretch out much, much more. If you haven't figured out from the captured footage, I gave the PC version a majority of my attention for this playthrough due to the increased visual fidelity and some extra bells and whistles, but I didn't realize until I was halfway into the game that the save function was completely broken. No matter where I saved on the Steam version, I would always load back into the beginning of an area, almost like the saves were just saving progress up to a certain checkpoint. I don't know if this was just one of those one in a million PC bugs or a common issue everyone has, but since the game is prone to crashing at the start of some cutscenes, I had to replay large parts of this game several times over just to get to the end. So why did I keep playing this busted ass version of the game you might be wondering? Well don't get me wrong, native 1080p is a very attractive option compared to the muddy internal 720p output of the console versions, but more than anything, I was just looking to play the game at 60 frames per second, and thanks to the aforementioned mod, I was able to do just that. The gameplay experience was noticeably improved at 60fps, but there's only so much you can do to polish a turd, and with that being said, let's see how the console ports fared. Homecoming was released on the major platforms of the day, that being the PS3 and 360, but I honestly never gave those versions too much attention back then. For this video, I grabbed the PS3 port since my 360 finally died on me a little while ago, and right off the bat, the drop down to 30fps gameplay was rough to get used to, especially in a game that requires you to make some quick reads in combat and react with well-timed dodges. Having the frames essentially halves the amount of time I had to react to wind-ups, and even though the knife still cut through mostly everything in the game, I found myself taking a lot of cheap hits. Other than a lessened frame rate, I noticed much more slowdown, but typically this didn't get in the way of actually playing the game. It never seemed to show up in combat, probably due to the tighter camera you get when aiming a weapon, so it was really only noticeable when running around the game world, which is a little annoying, but definitely not the worst thing in the world. One thing that was definitely a welcome change when moving over to the console version was the fact that saves actually worked this time around. 
It felt really good knowing that if an enemy stun locked me into a cheap death, I could just start from a save point just a few rooms away instead of having to remake a bunch of progress in that area. But really, those were the only differences I found, which is understandable. The 360 and PS3 ran on power PC architecture, so accurately translating the whole game over to PC was pretty normal and easy to do back then. Overall, I was not thrilled with the gameplay Homecoming had to offer though, no matter what platform it was on. The exploration I expect out of a Silent Hill game just wasn't there, and I don't want to hear anything about bringing the style into a modern era. Even Origins had the good sense to plop the player into a big complicated area and let them navigate their way through the labyrinth. The linear progression here in Homecoming just does not feel right in a Silent Hill game. Adding insult to injury, the scant times you do have to backtrack are contained within the same route that leads from the Shepherd home to the graveyard, so it's not like I could even enjoy the scraps the devs decided to throw me. As for the series staple of challenging puzzles, there were a few that did incorporate more than just mechanical trial and error, but these were very few and far between. Combat is a red-hot mess thanks to inconsistent physics, which really drags the experience down because the devs require you to make some frame-perfect inputs to do well. The very small amount of leeway granted, mixed with a fluctuating frame rate and constantly varying active frames, makes for an insanely frustrating experience. And while most SH games would allow for avoiding combat, the large size of the enemies and mostly narrow interior areas makes this almost never an option. On top of that, I could not stand the radio menus and separate buttons assigned to the weapon and item inventory screens. Up until the very end of the game, I was still hitting the wrong shoulder button. And even when I did get the menu I wanted, I would flick the thumbstick at the item I needed to use or equip, but sometimes the stick would activate the opposite direction on its trip back to the center, and I would either be holding the wrong weapon, or I'd end up using one of my few health restoring items again. And once again, I'm not sure if this was just me, but it felt like an eternity of gameplay existed between scenes that would advance the plot. I think this may have been one of the hardest games for me to get through, but not because of the difficulty. I mean, once you figure the whole knife thing out, it's pretty smooth sailing up till the end, but instead, I just wasn't having any fun. Which really sucks, because there were some brief glimpses of good design dotted all over the place. Times when I fully understood what the game wanted from me, and enjoyed doing it. But just as I would feel this game would slow to a crawl, or an enemy would lock on to me with an 8-hit combo, or I would accidentally use a healing item again. It's actually kind of hard to describe now that I think about it. The frustration I kept feeling seemed like it came from the game's nearly unfinished level of bugs and gameplay issues, but in reality it came from constantly having a fun time pulled right out from under my feet. It was like a sawtooth, the game kept going up and down in quality and enjoyment. If it were constantly bad or good, it would be much easier to explain, but that's definitely not the case here. It feels like the developers were made up of two different groups, one that really wanted to make a Silent Hill game, and the other intent on shoving in as many modern game tropes as possible. The only problem being, neither of those groups were very good at making a video game. The bugs, performance issues, and poorly implemented combat just reeks of amateur level game creation, and I honestly can't recommend Homecoming's gameplay because of it. Now, I understand that there may be some of you willing to forgive all that, but coming from someone who lets a lot of stuff slide in the name of story, immersion, or atmosphere, Homecoming is without a doubt not worthy of your time. I know this game has its following, but for the life of me, I just can't understand where you guys are coming from. I really did try with this one, but I just didn't have any fun with it. As far as modern, western-developed SH games go, this is by far the worst one I have played. Silent Hill Homecoming is very much a product of its time as far as presentation goes. While it doesn't run on Unreal Engine like 90% of the games released during its era, it shares a lot of visual quirks with Unreal games. First off, every single part of the game has a glossy shine to it, which can be distracting as hell in a game that's supposed to be dark a majority of the time, and it runs like shit. Both the PS3 and PC ports start dropping frames in areas with a lot of fog, and for some reason, just having enemies loaded into the game world seems to drag things to a crawl. And no, I don't mean having several enemies on screen will slow things down. Just having them load in is enough to do the trick. Oftentimes, I would see one of these smog monsters lurch out of the mist, slowing my frame rate down with their presence, and I would turn and run away thinking it would make things run faster, but nope, even when they're well behind Alex and are no longer visible, the slowing effect they have on the game speed is still in effect 
until you kill them and their bodies disappear. Alex's character model is okay looking but seems very boxy, kind of like his jacket and pants are a few sizes too big. And on top of that, there was one really interesting thing I noticed. Alex, his dad, and Officer Wheeler are the only characters that have any depth to their facial textures. The rest of the characters have these oddly smooth faces that look very doll-like. I can't really understand why this would be the case. I mean, even major characters have this issue. In the first few minutes of the game, you'll talk to Alex's mom, and it looks like she's recently peeled away most of the layers of her skin on her face. And speaking of faces, it seems like the devs over at Double Helix had no idea how to animate mouths. Alex seems to get away with some very, very simple animations, but other characters like Elle and her mother seem to have very few points of articulation. Their lips wrap under their teeth, and Elle specifically looks like her lips were modeled closed, and the team just warped that same model as a flat line. Kind of makes it look like she's got more duck face than a 2010 Facebook page, though. Officer Wheeler, on the other hand, has almost no animations in his mouth in certain scenes, which never failed to get a laugh out of me. One thing that really bothered the hell out of me were the black levels and dark scenes. Some dark areas looked believably inky and impenetrable, but most others had this hazy gray look to them. Kind of like how it looks when you jack the brightness up on your TV looking at media that was recorded way too dark. This really ruined some parts of the game, and for some reason the gamma slider in the options menu just wouldn't do anything, so I was sort of stuck with these foggy gray areas where it should be pitch black. Finally getting to some compliments though, the town of Shepherd's Glen looks really convincing. The streets and storefronts are all in shambles, and the thick fog that covers the whole place just fits together perfectly. Interior areas can be hit or miss sometimes, but mostly I liked how interesting they looked. If you're really paying attention, you'll see some repeated props and textures, but nothing too egregious in my opinion. Sometimes a cutscene will put you in a position that makes the low resolution 3D objects seem a little more obvious, but using this PC version, we are pushing the game a little further than it was meant to go, so that's understandable. More than anything, I think Homecoming did a great job of laying out a thick and oppressive atmosphere more often than not. Some stuff didn't make any damn sense, like the police precincts looking like it had been left to the ravages of time, despite there still being an active police force, but a majority of the game's areas just look gloomy and effective from a horror perspective. And while I didn't really like the enemy design overall, sexy nurses and pyramid head very much included, I did really like the way some of the bosses looked. There's a good amount of body horror going on here, and a few of them do a really good job at mirroring that Silent Hill creature design that we all know and love. Really, the only exception is this lanky doll boss, which just looks kind of basic to me. Like I said before, most of my experience with this game comes from the PC version, and trust me, it has some dead serious visual bugs, but thanks to a few patches I was able to find, there was only one major one that showed up here in this last area. And speaking of patches, why don't we talk specifically about the PC experience without them? Being one of the laziest attempts at a PC port, a vanilla install of Homecoming on modern platforms like Steam won't really come with any more visual fidelity than on console. I mean, yes, it will of course look a little better here, but changing the resolution is damn near impossible without crashing. If you are able to force a higher resolution though, the shadows don't scale appropriately, and sadly the frame rate remains locked at a sluggish 30 FPS. On top of this, it was terribly optimized to the point where my fairly respectable Ryzen 7 1700 and GTX 1080 Ti still weren't able to keep it at a locked 30. Since I have a bit of history with this version of the game, I knew right off the bat that I would need a bit of help getting this bad boy running the way I wanted. So after a quick Google search, I was taken to its section, the PC Gaming Wiki. From there, I downloaded these two patches, which both fixed many of the game's issues with crashing and added the visual tweaks I was looking for. Using a DLL injector instead of Homecomings.exe, I was able to get 1080p 60fps working no problem, along with having access to a wider FOV, getting rid of the nasty static slash film grain filter, options for saving anywhere, and multi-sampling and de-aliasing with VSync. Although slowdown was still very much a thing in certain circumstances. Without a doubt, these patches are a must-have when spinning up Homecoming on PC. They definitely can't fix the many, many, many issues this release has, but they do make the experience much easier to stomach. But we should at least give a little bit of attention to the way most people saw the game at launch. The PS3 original, as expected, is a much lower res, blurry affair, and sadly this lack of resolution does not mean a smoother frame rate. Even at a locked 30 frames per second, this game slows down every chance it gets. Getting used to dropping from playing the game at 60fps to 30 was hard enough, but 
I couldn't even play it at a constant 30. All that being said, I very well may nominate this console version as the definitive way to first experience the game, which seems crazy for me. Sure, you might miss the hell out of the added fidelity that comes with 1080p and getting rid of the dumb looking scratchy film grain filter that's over every single frame of this thing, but I don't know, the muddier softer look of the graphics here do a really good job at hiding a lot of the many imperfections. Those porcelain smooth faces I was talking about before don't stand out nearly as much here, and even the spots that force you to get up close and personal with the low res textures don't seem to look half as bad here on console. The save system actually working is a very nice plus, and button overlays actually reflect the controller you're using, which is something sorely missed in the PC port. I know it sounds crazy, but at least in this one instance, the blurrier option seems to be the best option. Of course, you knew I wasn't just going to leave you hanging without a comparison, so here's how the two versions of Homecoming look side by side. As you can see, there is a very clear and noticeable difference from one to the other, but trust me when I say you're going to be begging for that console downgrade after just half an hour with this buggy mess of a PC port. You know, after the relatively positive experience I had with Origins and the absolute surprise Shattered Memories gave me, it's a little sad to not like Homecoming even a little. Don't get me wrong, there are a very small number of things it gets right, but most of the time those small accomplishments are left surrounded by poor optimization, buggy effects, badly designed areas, and an absolutely broken combat system. Like I said before, the moments when Homecoming shines tends to make the game much more annoying, since all that does is leave you wishing you could be playing a game that was mostly this good. Since the story has no real effect on any long-running SH canon, except for cementing my theory that Western devs have just been remaking Silent Hill 2 over and over again, hoping we won't notice, you're not exactly missing out on anything if you decide to give this one a pass. If anything, the only reason I would say this game should be played is to really contrast how well made the first four games in the series were. Sure, it may be hard to look at a game running in 480i nowadays, but at the very least that game will look better artistically, play better, and run smoother than anything you're likely to see here. So maybe Shepherd's Glen was a wasted stop on our little trip through the events surrounding Silent Hill's sordid past, but make sure to stick around, because next up we'll be checking out the game most fans of Modern SH swear by. Now of course, until then, I hope to see all of you again right here on the Silent Hill Retrospective. Well, hello there guys. Thanks for sticking through this one and thank you so much for all the love and support you always seem to throw my way. Please, please stay safe in this very unsure time and make sure to cancel any unneeded expenses if you're hurting for money right now. That means if you support me on Patreon or sub to me on Twitch, please take that money and put it towards keeping you and your family safe. Don't get me wrong, I really appreciate the support, but you guys gotta make sure you and yours are taken care of before little old me. Everyone keep safe and I will see all of you next time.